Hi, everybody. Hi, gang. Hopefully you're out there. Um, if we have any problems with the audio, please uh, message that to us. Um, if not, we're going to assume that we've got audio. Um, we know we've been playing with the video here. And um, yeah. You're out there? Yep, you're good. Awesome. Cool. We just got confirmation from our folks in Winnipeg there that we got audio and we can see that we're up and rolling here too. So, um, yeah, so, uh, so we'll give it, hopefully you got a uh, notification for this. There are a lot of people that said they're going to be um, joining us. So if you are joining us, thank you. If you're, uh, if you join us midstream, um, we've been told that the entirety of our seminar will be shared on our website or on our web pages, uh, Facebook pages, I should say. Uh, so um, if you do join us midstream, uh, we'll mention that more than once. And please uh, just follow along and maybe tomorrow or in the days to come, the full seminar will be there. All right, so uh, we're about a minute from getting started. We just wanted everybody, if you needed a quick washroom break, we're just making sure our technology is still working, making sure that we can sort of kind of see your chats coming in. We're still working on that a little bit. I might have opened the wrong button here. Uh, but I see that uh, uh, our friends Dan Goulet and our nephew Mitch Manity, we've got good representation from Manitoba tonight. They're, they're right. watching, so... Thanks, guys. Uh, thanks a lot, thanks, Dan. Thanks, Mitchie. And our buddy Jason uh, with The Real Angle uh, in Ontario is also watching us tonight. So I, we appreciate right. that, too. Thank you very much, Jason. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we're, we're almost ready to rock and roll here with everybody, guys. And we appreciate all of you coming tonight. Uh, but, uh, rolling here. Uh, so for those of us who, uh, for those of you, I should say, who don't know uh, Jeff and I, uh, we're getfishing.ca. Uh, we're also Bass Pro Cabela's ambassadors, and we're very appreciative of Cabela's for, uh, uh, you know, giving us this opportunity to talk to you. And we're leading off a star-studded group. Uh, our, our friend and mentor, Gord Pizer and Liam Wetter are up next week, I understand. So we're going to do our best to tee up for that, uh, for sure. So, um now, I guess the first thing we're going to do is this is all about aggression, aggression. And I think there's a tendency when we talk about ice fishing that sometimes we get a bit more subtle. We talk a lot about how fish are cold blooded and they slow down a little bit. Uh, but uh, I think the important thing here is, is to understand that aggression can make a big difference and to sort of define what aggression means and how fish kind of interact with their world. Uh, we've got Jeff, and you're just going to talk a little bit about the biology of aggression and why it's so important. Sure, yeah. Like, the thing is, um, when it comes to fish, uh, they're very much like us. We're both vertebrates. Um, just because we have ears, it doesn't mean that we hear better than fish do. Um, there are main physical characteristics and senses that fish have that uh, appeal to aggressive presentations. So Jason mentioned, we're going to focus on that. We're gonna talk perch, walleye, pike, and bourbon. So we've got a lot of, to cover, um, but if I was to give you a, a, one of the classic Rapala ribbon wraps, um, the, the fellas in Manitoba might recognize this as a fantastic lure for big, big, big greenbacks on Lake Winnipeg. Now, this lure appeals to three, I call them the big three, the main three that you're trying to appeal to in a fish uh, when you're using aggressive presentations. The first thing I talk about is sound, and sound is extremely important because in the water, a fish can hear this lure several hundred feet away way before uh, any other senses kick in. As they get a little bit closer, this is a lipless crankbait. So like all crankbaits, it, it moves water. As it vibrates through the water, it sends out vibrations that fish pick up on their lateral line. Now, how could I explain that? I've tried many, many 
uh, different analogies, but I'm going to use the one uh, where you step out of the shower and the overhead vent kicks in. You know from the feeling on your body where that's coming from and how cold it is. So that's something like the lateral line sense in a fish. Finally, as it gets closer and picks up that lateral line sense, it finally sees the flash, the visual. So those are the three big uh, senses that a fish has that's hunting that are going to get that fish within five feet of your lure so that they may actually go ahead and smell or taste or, you know, finally eat it. So we'll keep talking about sound, vibration, and sight. Those are the big three when you're using attraction and actually aggression presentations. Perfect. Okay, Jeff, so you've lined up what aggression means and how fish kind of feel your lures. So I'm going to start by showing you my favorites. These are ones that have caught trophy everything, trophy pike, trophy perch, uh, trophy walleyes. And one of our favorites, uh, really, when it comes to aggression, are part of the uh, Rapala group, the good old standard jig and rapella, which you see here. Everybody on this call tonight is probably familiar with it, probably has one or more in their tackle box. That's what it is. That's what it looks like. This is a number five. So I'm just going to set my rod down for a sec. Um, when we talk about aggression, and we're going to get into talk a little bit about decoying too, you can tell that there's a significant difference between the number five and the number nine here, right? So big, bigger lure, more vibration, more pounding, more that type of thing. So lots of times we'll use that bigger one to draw fish in and then uh, have the secondary um, lure, the smaller one, to actually trigger them when they come in. What's really interesting, and I'm going to just shake it in the box here, another one that is quickly becoming our fast favorite for perch of all sizes is the rip and wrap. Now, this is the number three. I, I almost wish they made a number two, but this one makes the perch go mental. In fact, Jeff and I were out on a local lake with our uncle and our families on the weekend, and the rip and wrap, you wouldn't believe how it outfished everything. And when the perch were gone, you dropped this down and all of a sudden they showed up and they got real interested. And the key with this one, even though the number three, when it's tied on a rod and reel, is not that big, it makes that rattle, it makes that sound, it makes that racket. They were even biting the perch one, which proves that perch will eat each other. But also, we even had smaller perch beaten up on this thing. They couldn't get their mouths around it. Then all of a sudden, we get a rager of a 10 to 12 incher come in, screaming at the lure, scare everything out, and just wolf this thing. So um, that aggression uh, on, on perch that just seemed quite uh, meh, uh, you know, it, it fired up the school. It got them going. And we even had our, our friend Robin. And Robin, I don't know if you're watching tonight. Uh, but I gave him that lure because he normally has the, the mealworm and, the, and that type of thing. And he's, and he's like, I got the first fish and I got it on the uh, rip and wrap. And he was just out of control. And that's why we love him because he's very excitable. So, uh, but, but it just really, really goes to show that that works. And, and when Jeff was showing the bigger one, this one here that the Lake Winnipeg guys make a lot of, you know, uh, good work out of for their big fish. It's essentially the same lure. It's just there's the big version and there's the smallest one that they make. So these are the ones I use for, for perch and use for walleyes. Other ones, obviously, from the spoon categories, uh, we have the quarter ounce uh, real bait plain jane, which is an amazing lure. And this is the one ounce that, again, will we'll fish one in each rod at times. And uh, when the big fish finally come in with the attention and the vibration of the bang, bang, bang with the one ounce, we can clean up when they come in with this. Because the key uh, that a lot of people will, will, will say is that you're not going to catch if the fish aren't there. The big, the rattle, the aggression will bring them in. The aggression will often get them to bite. But if it doesn't, you can clean up with something less aggressive but that aggression lets them know they're there they feel it on their lateral line they're nowhere near the hole they and they, they seek that sound out to go get it so being a bit obnoxious under the ice is really really important to get those fish to come in so 
these are some of my favorites. As I say, we, we've got we've got uh, the the jig and wrap, the rip and wrap, uh, the the uh, real bait uh, spoons, and also it, the same thing goes with our, our other favorite, the real bait jig. You know where we got the the quarter ounce and the one ounce as well that can really clean up on the walleyes and that type of thing. So Jeff, I'm gonna. This is what I use for perch and walleyes to get some fish in your bucket so you have dinner. Now you're going to talk about the trophy aspect of it with big walleyes, pike, yeah. and burbot. All right. My favorite subject, big pike, big burbot, big walleyes. Um, anybody out there knows that to learn new things, a lot of times you have to be willing to get skunked. And that's what we've had to do sometimes when we're working on some of these big lures. Um, one word I might use is decoy, uh, and my my final pro, my final presentation uh, for the burbot slash pike program is what I'm talking about as a decoy. Now, before I go any further, though, um, I think you, I just want to reiterate uh, that idea that lots of times size uh, ma it, it always matters, but size doesn't necessarily make uh the fish be attracted um i spent an outrageous amount of <laughs> money out of pocket uh just putting together all kinds of uh big presentations big swim baits um big musky baits and uh on our big fish lake last mountain um the fish Absolutely, we're not interested on anything that was too outrageously big. And that's why those smaller, especially lures that make sound, like the rip and wraps, uh, the smaller ones obviously have a very different sound signature uh, than the big ones. And they seem to really bring the fish in. A higher pitch, perhaps, or whatever the case may be. Uh, we're just noticing that uh, we can call fish in with the smallest rattling baits and continue to have them interested in actually eating it. Now, another lure that I want to mention beyond noisy baits are vibrating baits. And um, this does not have any rattles in it. It's a slab wrap, but it's almost a hybrid between a lipless crankbait and a blade bait, a metal blade bait. It really vibrates. You can feel it all the way up your line. And um, again, the smaller sizes for walleye and perch uh, are our best bets. Um, we really like in the waters that we fish that are colored uh, glow colors. Um, but uh, anytime I'm using um, the rattling baits, I want a glow or a natural color. Um, because as I said, that sound gets them in, the vibration gets them closer, and then the look of it uh, gets them really close and natural pearls, um, silver blue, those types of things uh, are our best bet at the chance of actually making our attracting bait or our decoy bait um, a, a, a hooking bait. Uh, so that's the sound. I'm, I'm going to go beyond that because Jason already mentioned what we use for big walleyes, and that is lures or jigs i should say like the flasher jig this is a three quarter ounce um with the blades and now i've gone beyond rattle lures to blade with jigs that have blades um, and swimming baits that have blades because this blade is extremely attractive visually uh, but this willow leaf blade we have used for just about 20 years now um, all four seasons and you put a huge shiner on the three quarter and do a not rips because of course if you have bait on and you rip it it's going to rip off but just full as high as we can reach when we're outside and let it plummet that plummeting action um, a lot of you out there will notice that when you cut a whole bunch of fresh lures or a whole bunch of fresh holes rather um, dropping going to the new hole dropping it down boom, you get a fish. And I think that plummeting from high up downward, not just fishing within the top or the bottom foot and a half,
but that full plummet where that jig can actually pick up speed and vibration is, is amazing. And that's where we use two holes. One hole has the three quarter ounce flasher jig. And our other hole has the one eighth ounce flasher jig, maybe with a minnow head or an eyeball of a perch or a smaller walleye. And you can fish both rods. You can have two rods fish side by side um, and, and just pick up a cadence for both of them. But what I like to do is just rest this little one on the bottom and keep fishing that big heavy jig up, down, up, down, up, down to bring in fish. And lots of times they'll eat that big jig. Uh, a three pound walleye, two and a half pound walleye will eat that big jig and, and jumbo shiner. Uh, but when they aren't interested, when they look at it, they stare it down. They don't want to grab it. This is where I set, we will set that big jig just on the bottom so that it's no longer in play and there's no target confusion between the two. And this is where, this is what that big fish will eat. So that's kind of one of our aggression, not sound, but vibration and color and presentation and and horizontal presentation of that big jumbo shiner really, really makes a difference. All right, one thing I wanted to just mention is uh, really that we talk aggression and we start by saying bigger lures. Aggression really doesn't have much to do with lure size. It's all in a lot of times how you fish it, but also there are aggressive style lures, you know, like, you know, the, the uh, jig and wrap, the way it'll swim around, you know, by natural, just a few rips and, and, and 10 foot jigs up and down, you wouldn't believe how you can bring fish in on that. Um, you know, and obviously the rattle helps a ton to bring fish in, you know, the rattle of, of the, uh, of the rip and wrap, uh, you know, it's pretty loud, obviously, as I shake it here, try to get it in frame. And as that wobbles through the water and shakes in the package. Um, you know, so that's that's a real key part of all of it as well. Um, you know, but thanks, Lloyd. Thanks, Clayton. Yeah, we're going to get the questions here too right away. Yeah, so feel free if you want to throw some questions in the chat of what we talked about. We're going to do our best to uh, to answer those. Um, <laughs> so apparently, somebody's phoning Jeff right now with a question, uh, which uh, text us instead. So uh, yeah, that that's really the, the thing I wanted to talk about too. Is that it, there, there's the decoy at play, bringing in two lures, fishing aggressive with one. Obviously, the bigger the lure, the more noise, the more vibration, the more distraction it can create. And uh, and and I guess I call it almost a disturbance on the flat because that's what you want to do. You want to give the fish a reason to come to you and uh, jigging aggressively using these aggressive techniques as opposed to, you know, just sitting there maybe with a smaller lure, uh, minnow on a pail, which... You know, as a seminar for another day, uh, you know, that can be a big uh, reason to trigger those fish because we find a lot of times when they're not aggressive is when these aggressive techniques really pay off, don't they, Jeff? Well, and it's, it is a little bit surprising um, sometimes when you think the, the, it, the day is lost, you know, it's a wash, the fish just aren't biting, um, and a, an aggressive presentation surprises you because... Um, it, as I said, it appeals to those three big things that hunting fish are looking for. They're, they're listening for, as Jason said, disturbance uh, on the flat. They're feeling for um, movements that might be a school of shiners. It might be predators in the area, which would give them a, a different reaction, of course. Or perch that are spread out on a, on a flat. Um, one perch gets into, uh, starts rooting out a whole bunch of grubs and, uh, you know, chronomids and, and, and blood worms. Um, they just converge on it. So I think we really do believe that those aggressive presentations um, cause fish to think that, think that um, there's something going on that they're missing out on. And you, you start ripping a big flasher jig. And uh, man, the perch start just piling in 
and uh, that's when you go to you know smaller presentations or, or dead sticks or that type of thing. And I think the other thing, and, and anybody who's perch fish notices, if you can get more than one perch below your hole, um, that's when things really start to light up. It, it's that that spirit of competition really gets those that species fired up. And I know it's true with others as well because they don't want to miss out on a male. I mean, we hear this all the time with the bass guys and having that throwback lure in the boat, right? You know, it's the same sort of idea that right. you create that kind of commotion, you bring in that uh, uh, competitive nature of those fish, and then they, they start to feed as opposed to those loners that come in and they're kind of meh, you know, uh, a, a little bit too. And, and I do, I guess, want to talk a little bit about uh, the, the camera piece too, because an underwater camera really aids you big time in this in this hunt in this search because well, your electronics can on the can, weekend yeah exactly 25 or 30 of our 40 fish maybe were all yeah. converted on the underwater camera on yeah. the aqua view yeah and um yeah and and that's the thing we've we spent a lot of time with our aqua views uh so that we can vet the information literally ground truth it before we share with you um and save you a lot of time um, and another reason why we picked this topic, I don't know if Jason mentioned it off the, off the beginning, but um, later in the winter, heavy snow, uh, you know, cold weather um, restricts people to either a, a hub that they can pop up and, and fish out of or, you know, uh, an ice shanty and being able to ap appeal to those, those three, that sound, vibration and get fish in your area and once they're on your you know paper route so to speak then you really get then you get to play the presentation game that everybody likes to play uh, but you can't play a presentation game without any fish now before we just talk a little bit about the underwater camera did you uh, want to talk about the most aggressive well, aggressive that uh, yeah i know you're literally vibrating I to am. show us <laughs> Oh, all right man. yeah well i i told you you'd hear about blade bladed lures this right here is the 4.4 ounce Bondi Mini back. That's a number six blade. It is about eight inches long. And that's this, a musky bait. This is a musky bait. That's right. And this was what we consider the first legitimate all out decoy lure for burbot. This is what we use to bring burbot in and really annoy them when they're on their spawning shoals. And uh, it was amazing the first time we used this out at Last Mountain Lake in Saskatchewan here, um, because it was kind of one of our favorite spots. But uh, when we got the camera set up and I started, you know, high hopping this, you know, seven or eight feet off the bottom and plummeting it into the bottom, um, there were four burbot on the screen at any given time. And uh, this is a lure. This one still has the hooks on. Um, if you do get this and you do use it for the burbot, um, we actually took the hooks off because we were, um, the, a lot of burbot were hitting it with their body or slashing it with their head. And we were hooking them in the cheek or whatever. Um, we found that if we took these and put, instead of these uh, five aught trebles, uh, we put maybe a number two, uh, you know, uh, kind of like off a wall I crank and um, the burbot that actually wanted to eat it did eat it and did get those hooks and we didn't get so many fish slashing it and then the bonus of that that very first adventure that very first day I got my biggest uh, pike through the ice which was a 46 inch pike uh, that just t-bone this came out of nowhere and just gobbled the whole thing so it is really really exciting um, and as I said, those blades, if I was to go, uh, if I was to take a uh, choice between rattle baits and bladed baits, I would, I would take bladed baits because I think they have enough of a range with that vibration, that really heavy vibration and that flashing uh, to bring fish in for quite a ways. Um, I don't, I wish I, I, I hope I don't have to choose <laughs> mm -hmm. because I yeah. do like my rattle baits too, but that's, that's yeah. our burbot pike program. And yeah, Jason will take it from there. Well, and I just want to quickly mention our, our good friend and creator of the Real Bait Empire, Al Patterson. Uh, thank you for joining us, Al. You commented to say that I've uh, been seeing a lot more transitioning towards the half ounce and three quarter ounce jigs, even in shallow water. And 
Uh, for sure, that that's working for our bourbon and our pike, even the one ounces, some big walleyes on, on the one ounce too. And Al said, don't forget the Fergie. This was the original lure that uncracked the giant walleyes for us with the rattle on it. It's it's the plain Jane spoon with the rattle on it. We even have uh, a featured video on getfishing.ca, our new and improved website that shows the clacker all by itself tied up for perch. So there's another uh, rattle situation there. Definitely, there too. Yeah. definitely an aggressive presentation because the one ounce spoon, which is our bread and butter, um, planes off to the side very, very well. So when you're ice fishing it, or eat, well, if you're you're drifting it in, in the fall, you're yeah. it's planing to either side of the boat as you're going down a break line. But through the ice, you lift this and let it drop, drag it to the middle, fish it, lift it all the way up and let it ride again because it's that, that you know, 20 foot drop that allows it to really plane out to the sides and reach fish that you wouldn't be able to. Now, what we need to talk about before we forget that we did have in our notes to talk about is it's fine to talk about aggressive lures, but what do you need for the tool? The, the rod and reel is key, obviously, for this. So for the those uh, number five to number seven uh, jig and wraps, rip and wraps, uh, I would say up to half ounce spoons. I got six pound test. I, I'm using uh, the uh, the lighter ice uh, suffix uh, that on this uh, my spool that I have loaded up here. And what I've got is one of my favorite rods, my good old fashioned Cabela's Fish Eagle 50, medium light. So it's got a fairly quick tip on it here, but, and you can fish, you know, you know, a four pound test on it as well, but it's beefy enough. It beefs up pretty quick here that it, it can handle those bigger fish and handle those good hard head thumps of a big walleye, which is what I really, really like about it. Now for the rip and wrap, when I'm fishing the perch size, I've got my HT uh, Sapphire Series Ultralight, and this one you can really see it's super soft on the tip. It does load up fairly quick here, so if you've got a good fish, you're going to be all right with it, but I put four-pound test on, on here as well. Now, uh, if I'm worried about line spin, and we're not going to really talk about it tonight, but we, we have some straight line reels that uh, if we're getting really aggressive, sometimes it's a good idea to help reduce that line spin. Because if your lures do it, line twist, I should say, because if your lure's spinning like this, fish aren't going to bite it. That That's just a not a natural thing. So that's kind of my setup for those smaller fish. Jeff, yeah. what do you use for the bass yeah, or actually, the heavier stuff? I, uh, the 36-inch medium omen rod by 13 Fishing is a rod that I will fish all the way down to four-pound test. Uh, but I'll also fish all the way up to 15 pound braid on it. If I'm doing that, you know, that uh, two fisted walleye jig with the flasher jig, um, the Omen's a really nice uh, rod for that. And for the Bondi, um, they're pretty easy to find. This is the HT, uh, it's lake trout, heavy action. Heavy is an understatement for this, but uh, it's perfect for ripping those big, big blades. It really moves this lure really quick. And then uh, my spinning reel, I've got 30 pound braid on it. And I do have a 50 pound fluorocarbon leader. And what that is for is I have at least as long of a leader as I do thickness of ice. So typically I have about a 50 inch leader and uh, what that allows you to do is if you do have a big burbot uh, that ties itself up at the bottom of the hole, they love to do that. Um, in our videos, those of those of you that have seen our burbot videos, we got a great video of these big burbot, their head comes in the hole and their tail just stops the bottom of the ice. And that's where that heavy leader is because you just hold that leader and as they start to relax, you just pull them up and out. So that'll get you, uh, set for all of these presentations all right so we're going to take some questions if uh some folks in the chat uh, uh you know have any you can go ahead and put them there uh but uh, aquaview has come out this year with a whole new series of hd underwater cameras some with digital video recorders in them as well uh the 722 uh and the one that is, is exclusive to cabela's actually has an enhanced length of cable so if you're in really uh, clear water and you want to really stretch that out, you can. Uh, this is basically the housing and what it looks like. It's it's a bigger version than the micro system. Uh, but as I say, it, it, it's full HD. Um, 
has port HDMI mini ports to come out if you want to connect it to that larger monitor system. Um, and uh, good USB connection for your computer as well. Um, and uh, this is kind of the system here. It, it's got the, uh, the exclusive sort of, uh, uh, I was going to say, AquaView cable reel system that you basically flip it open like this. So it makes it really easy to wind and unwind that cable. And it's got a few different adapters for the actual uh, uh, part of the camera head itself that allows a down view, allows a forward view, uh, a rather side view. Uh, if you find the fish are spooky, you want to just hang it above their head like that. Uh, drill another hole beside you uh, so you're not trying to have it in the same hole at once because you get a big fish, they're going to wrap it up. And this cable is fairly light, so you want to try to protect it from wrapping up with other fish. Uh, but uh, but this is what we're using now. We, we really, really love it. We've had an opportunity to field test yeah. it a couple times. I'd say and it really, really held up. The thing I'd say about this new, the micro that's, you know, so so small and portable is the closest thing to, you know, everybody that has their own flasher or something like that. This is a step, a big step closer to everybody having their micro camera that they use. Yeah. And man alive, it, we know it makes a big difference for perch. Uh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, we, when we were out with our cousins in the week and they've got the big HD TV sitting in their, their shack and uh, we were able to plug in with their AquaView and, and, you know, fill the whole room like a lot of folks out there have done with that with that spare HD TV television. So uh, and the video quality was was very very good with this system so we, we really really like it and it all packs away beautifully in a case this big so it's very portable and very easy to move around the other thing is uh, i wanted to mention too uh we didn't grab it uh but uh the the new aqua v or sorry the the new ion uh alpha auger that we have with the variable speed is perfect for the shacks because it you can you slowly can cut a hole really set the center pin up perfectly and you're not going to wobble all over the place and stuff and it also i think just gives a little bit more stealth above the ice that electric yeah. auger uh, yeah because, we're talking yeah. about noise yeah noise below the ice exactly uh the noise below the ice is something that fish might be interested in the noise above the ice is in fact something they're not interested in whatsoever um, so that's why uh, ever since we've been fishing the or using the ions, um, at the end of the day in March in the river mouth at Echo Lake where I live, um, I just drill a whole bunch of holes. And uh, when some of my local buddies show up and, you know, not necessarily intentionally uh, try to muddy the waters by firing up their big gas auger, I just say, hey, boys, all the holes are here for you. Come join me. Let's fish. Let's catch fish because uh, the last thing you want is making a lot of noise above the water. And that might be a bit of a topic for another day too, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, and and shallow in particular is, is mm -hmm. key. And, and just a quick tip. I just thought of it. I want to share it. Uh, we have noticed how perch in particular react. Uh, you know, one of our lakes nearby Buffalo Pound, it's like 13 feet down the middle. Very, very shallow. And uh just putting, if you got an old rug, you know, uh, that that you had in, in the garage or something, you got a piece of it, throw it down and put your feet on that. Uh, you wouldn't believe how much crunch and crazy noise mm -hmm. it makes. And, and, and while it may not turn them off per se, it certainly distracts them from the job we need them to do, which is to bite our hook. So um, we're at the 732 mark now. We don't, uh, feel free, as I say, throw some questions in there, guys. And we can try to answer them now. Uh, Jeff, you had sort of, as we always do, it's kind of our getfishing.ca trademark mm -hmm. that we have a conservation piece uh, because we know these work and we're happy to share these tips with you, mm -hmm. but you're going to catch so many fish doing it that you need to, you know, limit uh, your harvest and yeah. harvest the right fish. And and it's very important in the wintertime because a lot of the big, all the big perch, walleye, burbot, and pike, yeah. uh, uh, are females. They, they're the key to the next generation. And when we do are blessed to get those, uh, you know, uh, those bites, we absolutely want to make sure that we're letting them go and treating them well when they're yeah. in our care. Well, and I'd, I'd like to give a shout out to all the, uh, you know, uh, YouTubers that we know that do a lot of their filming and a lot of their work, work inside their hub. 
Uh, that's a perfect environment to take a picture of a fish and deal with it and let it go. Um, you know, uh, you really have to, uh, I hope my uh, my analogy of getting out of the shower and having the, uh, for the fan blast you uh, and get a shock to the system. You can only imagine how that, how a fish that's been at already down to four or five degree bod core body temperature, uh, how quickly that fish's eyes and gills are going to freeze. So, you know, be conscious of that, having a warm place to take some pictures and that type of thing. That's great. Otherwise, just, you know, turn and burn, let that fish go. And uh, it's going to make a big difference in um, our, our, our fishery, uh, you know, limit your kill. Don't kill your limit every time you go out. And, and depth too is important, isn't it? You know, trying, yeah, trying to that's focus right. on the 25 feet or less. Yeah. And you know, the best fishermen are, are conscious of fishing in, you know, hopefully 20 feet or less. Um, but certainly 30 feet or less, um, unless they're, you know, like there is a situation where on our home, like at around, like where we were kids, the fish were in, they, they were perch and we were keeping every one but it was deeper than 30 feet. And, uh, you know, we've we've learned beyond that, and we certainly don't go there to, to harvest a whole bunch of fish. Yeah, and, uh, and, and if we do, we go out, we get enough to eat, and then get we're done. Fish, and then then we're done, right? And then we go shallow yeah. and try to focus on walleye pike and find, because yeah. there's more fish in the shallows than There's more think, fish. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. You know, you, yeah. you learn some spots and learn how to fish stealthfully, uh, like a lot of the trout, trout specialists do, stock trout specialists, they fish really shallow. Absolutely. And uh, they catch some huge fish. So keep that in mind. And, uh, you know, if you have questions about that type of thing, give, us, give me a show. And uh, my biology degree can be put to good use. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll be happy to Absolutely. inform people about that. Uh, I had a question here from Lyndon Maurer. Uh, thank you for your question. The question Thanks, is, Linda. does the Aquaview have an internal rechargeable battery and how long does the battery last? Um, I haven't killed it yet. We were out for about six and a half hours is the longest I've used it so far. And that was the camera. I haven't even recharged it yet. I pulled the files out and uh, we still got two thirds of the battery remaining. So uh, we were in a hut all day. It was a fairly mild day. I suspect if you're out in the cold uh, without a heater or anything, it probably won't last as long. But the nice thing about that model is it actually charges with the same voltage as, an, as a phone does, like an iPhone or, or, a, or a smartphone. So if you've got one of those portable power packs, uh, you can actually boost your power and keep it going that way. Uh, you know, if, if you are running low, you don't need to have a 12 volt system like you do for the bigger Aquaviews, um, you know, if, if you want to do that. I know a lot of our, our friends who do the YouTube stuff like we do are coming out with, you know, sort of a lithium battery shuttle package too, which, you know, will power their, their uh, camera, their, their, uh, keep their fish finder topped up, their cameras, you know, their, their GoPros, their phones, the other stuff they use to bring the content to you. So that's another way you can boost your power source on, on all of your electronics out on the ice. Any other questions we have for, for folks? We're just going to kind of run through here. Um, I know that sometimes they'll load quickly, sometimes not so much. Uh, we do still have 31 sets of eyeballs if, on if, us. If, so I, we, can, we if wanna, I can do yeah. one more shout out, yeah. because um, for those of you that know me, uh, I'm a fish technician at the one and only fish hatchery in Saskatchewan. And we do walleye spawn camp on Buffalo Pound Lake by Moose Jaw. And every year uh, we get some big walleyes, 30, 31, 31 is the biggest I know of personally handling. And uh, the people ask me, well, why are you keeping eggs out of fish like that? They're, they're no good. They, they're, they're no longer reproductive ability. And I'm sort of like, well, no. Um, if you're on the farm and you're, and you're raising cattle, uh, yes, female cattle, cows, uh, do get to a point where they no longer physically are capable of, of giving birth. Uh, a fish dropping eggs is very, very different. Fish and reptiles are cold-blooded and they grow their entire life. They reproduce their entire life. And actually the size of the egg uh, that a fish produces is slightly bigger uh, the older it gets. So 
uh, a three pound fish that's just re just reaching maturity might have a 0.5 to 0.75 mill millimeter egg. That 31 incher that's 12, 13 pounds maybe uh, has a 1.2 millimeter egg. A bigger egg has a bigger yolk, more yolk means better nutrition and a more successful fertilization because it's bigger and uh, a better fry, a stronger fry. So uh, releasing those big fish makes all the difference in the world. Um, yeah. They've got to that point because Mother Nature wants them to get to that point. The Mother Nature wouldn't produce 25 pound pike and 10 pound walleyes that were immature, that were no longer in, that were infertile. Um, there's no purpose to creating a monster that's just going to eat all the groceries. Those fish contribute big time. Okay, so I was going to say, I'm, I'm kind of monitoring my page and I'm monitoring the Cabela's page at the same time for questions. And I realize if some folks are on Jeff's page, which we're not monitoring, uh, and there's questions there, we may not catch them because I was wondering why there were different questions in different places. So we'll make sure and do our best to answer if there's any on Jeff's page as well uh, after the seminar. Uh, but I was going to say, Tim, Tim uh, has a question. He said, in winter, do walleyes and have... Sorry, Bob. Didn't mean to hurt your feelings. Yeah, yeah. no, Bob said, save the preaching and talk fishing. So <laughs> we're, 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 we got the message. Fair we're enough. moving on to questions now. <laughs> so in winter, do walleyes inhabit shallow water more than we think? Um, do you want to just take it? I have my yeah. thoughts, but you go ahead. Well, what really happens... Um, early and late in the season, because um, early and late in the season, the whole ecosystem still pumping very strong uh, in the fall. Um, and it's not until later when truly the very basin of the lake is the warmest water in the whole system. And that's when a lot of fish dump into the basin. Now, as soon as the uh, there's any kind of melt and there's any water coming from the perimeter into the lake, narrows, that type of thing, um, that's when they'll be shallow again. However, there are many lakes that are notorious for shallow fishing. A friend of mine was catching walleyes and just you know, on the Coupel Lakes. I won't give away a spot, um, but uh, he was catching walleyes. He was catching walleyes in five feet of water um, in like this last weekend. So it's it's uh, very something you you have to stick your nose into those shallows every once in a while. Don't bottom out your auger on the gravel, but uh, yeah, check out those shallows. It doesn't take long either because the fish will either be there or they will not be there. Well, and I find, and you know, uh, one just one quick thing I want to add before we get to our next question is, um, I find the really really heavily stained lakes. Mm -hmm. There's more fish shallow it yep. seems, and yep, they stay shallow longer. Um, the ones that are a little bit clearer, they tend to go a little bit deeper and they, the shallower fish get active at twilight in those shallower areas. And, and twilight, as we get into the more deeper parts of winter, where literally it's the, it's as cold as the lake's going to get in like that in February, uh, early March before spring starts to arrive, uh, those fish do tend to go to at those twilight periods and tend to want to slip a little bit deeper too. A lot of it really depends on where their food goes. If a lot of their food goes deep, they're going to go deep. If their food stays shallow, they're going to stay shallow. So we got a question from Scott Rainey here that says, do Lake Diefenbaker rainbows reproduce naturally there or are they all stocked? Well, there was, there was some documentation of very, very limited uh, reproduction happening. I believe it was Hitchcock Bay. Um, but uh, in that was in years past. Um, Ninety, I would say, ninety-nine point nine percent of the trout um, are fish from the fish farm that annually find ways to escape. Um, fisheries uh, has, in the past, stocked rainbow trout, lake trout, um, but. Uh, there are remnant populations of lake trout caught from time to time, uh, but they really, it's not a winning battle for the trout there. Even though reservoirs uh, like Diefenbaker uh, elsewhere, you know, really can produce trout if there's an effort 
uh, to, to put them there. Well, they, do they not need rapids, flowing water, that type of thing? Yeah, yeah, for natural really reproduction. Successful? None of the reservoirs that I know of, like even stateside like Oahe and Sakakawea, um, have naturally reproducing rainbow trout. They have stocking programs where they put trout in there. Um, but Diefenbaker has the um, dubious uh, reputation of having a fish farm on there that they, as I said, they just escape from time to time. Um, and that those are the fish that are caught. The world records were triploid, uh, rainbow trout that escaped from the farm there. Right, and triploid means they're not able to reproduce. Yeah, that's right. Is, is, so, is what it means. So that's, you know, that's a, yeah. that's a good thing in that, yeah, they, they really, quite frankly, can't reproduce because yeah. they're they're triploid, not yeah. triploid like where. Yeah. There's a few that make it down from the bow. The bow, of course, is the upper reaches of the southern Saskatchewan River or the south Saskatchewan River, and some of those do make it through, and those are natural reproducers. Those those yeah. Yeah, those rainbows in the upper, yeah. upper reaches, and in that flood was, years, they would absolutely make their way. Yeah, and the in all fairness, there are yeah. rainbows that come from the bow there are brown trout that come from the bow and some of them end up there and they are caught but they don't reproduce in even bigger yeah at least not to the I would, level I would to say sustain it. the population yeah, to, to be able to yeah, yeah. that's that's what i meant yeah. yeah for sure but thanks for this question scott mm -hmm. that's a that's quite an a, you know a very interesting topic mm -hmm. um and yeah definitely a, something to watch for in years to come for sure yeah, and we, we apologize. Maybe if we did more of these, we would also be monitoring Jeff's Facebook account, uh, his, his uh, uh, ambassador page. In case there's questions there, feel free to post to mine because I've got my phone right up here and we're kind of watching four questions here. And we're also watching on the on the uh, Cabela's website page too. But we will go back and do our best to answer those questions later. If you want to go ahead and grab your phone, Jeff, just in case there's questions there. Um, the other thing, uh, you know, we, we wanted to, you know, uh, really point out is, uh, you know, you can't catch fish if they're not there. And I know it's really hard in the winter time, particularly when it's cold, particularly when you get a little older and you're full of a few aches and pains and your mobility isn't what it was when you were a young whippersnapper uh with a nice rotund belly to keep you warm but still tough as nails to be able to cut all those holes and go 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 uh but it is still important to keep some mobility to your program uh there there are great spots on spots and over time you figure out how to really understand when those fish are coming through on those spot on spots uh gps and mapping has made it more possible than ever yes. to be on the spot in the spot yeah so um so that's what we do have but i was just going to say that it's important um you know to, to continue to have some mobility in your program that's that's really the biggest thing i, I wanted to mention uh because that uh, you're not going to catch them if they're not there and uh and and even if you cut 30 holes and you see one or two approach your lure and go away yeah, there's a few there, but they're not really there. And and I can appreciate that for walleyes and, and, and other predators, like even big pike, we're starting to notice some of them get active just before dark too. We thought it was an all day affair often for pike, uh, you know, but it, it's one of those deals that, uh, you know, uh, it's, as I say, I, I can't emphasize enough, it's it's important to, to have some mobility. That doesn't mean hit 30, 40 spots, but be willing to explore an area a little bit because as Tim was asking, are they are walleyes shallow more than we think? Sometimes they are. Some days they're in five feet. Some days they're in 15. Some days they're in 30. So having that mobility to be able to hit those different spots is really, really key and critical. And uh, did you notice any questions in your page? No, you I didn't have any. Okay. They're, they're okay. repeats repeat sold for okay. there. So it's good. Okay, perfect. A any other questions we have for folks where we got our eye on, on here? Anything else you might want to mention about the aggression program, um, Jeff, before we predators, human, homo sapiens. Um, we, but we do hear, we use our sight and we use our hearing. Um, but the, the, uh, as I said, the lateral line of fish is different, uh, than the, than the sensation of touch that we have. They do touch and they do taste. 
Uh, but those are the last few things uh, that a predator does when they actually have their prey in hand. So um, when you are, as Jason said, um, out and about in, in, you know, whether it's a situation where you're with friends in the nice heated shack or something like that, um, when the fish aren't below you, uh, the only thing you can do is try and bring the predators to you. And the biggest thing in my mind that I feel is the most far reaching is sound. As I said, several hundred feet that fish can, it can hear um, a, a rattle bait. Um, and then as they get interested in, in getting closer, that's when they can feel next. So they hear and feel. And then that final sight is where they, you know, hone in on their target and come in. So um, you have something like that handy, but don't fish it for three hours straight. Um, give it five minutes and then just be patient and see if there's anything that shows up. Then another five minutes, see if they come in. Um, because uh, as for those perch with those big rattle baits, um, they were staying at arm's length. And uh, the smallest rattle baits were the ones that turned the trick. Um, one last thing that I, I haven't tried yet, but I think would work um, as opposed to just the one big uh, rip and wrap would be a daisy chain of two or three of the little rip and wraps. Because as you bring the first one out, that's the sound of one. You get the second one off the bottom, there's two of them and a very different vib vibration and sound uh, frequency going out there. And then maybe the third one. Um, and I just didn't get to try it, but yeah. we will try it and we will let you know how it works because that's what we do at getfishing.ca. Absolutely. And, and the other thing I wanted to say, um, you know, particularly for the shallow program, it's important to, I mentioned the carpet and trying to, you know, Jeff said, don't get out your power auger at prime time, like get your holes cut. If you're going to fish shallow water, get all that loud work done, you know, on top of the ice. Uh, and don't be doing it, you know, while prime time's in because fish will, will spook. They don't like what's going on necessarily above the ice, but they're willing to be curious about what's going on under the ice. Now, Mike, just Mike Garswood here, our buddy Mike, uh, thanks Mike for tuning in tonight, uh, said, hey guys, maybe some of the viewers want to know about the colors that you feel are effective for walleye and perch. Jeff is going to talk about that right now, but I just want to say color, and and, and we got this from from our, our good friend Gord, he said, "Color most of the time is the last consideration. Gord it's Pizer. not Gord Pizer. It's not that it's not important, but it's the last consideration. It is, it is the 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 action, the vibration, the motion of the lure that is most important. But color can make a difference at times, can't it, Jeff? Well, yes. And uh, as I did mention, uh, glow in the dark lures where we fish, it's kind of colored water." Um, is it's we tried every single color of the rip and wrap the baby rip and wrap um, and the glow was hands hands above anything else head and shoulders above anything else but um, any kind of a, a perch pattern is very good because when they do get close enough to inspect it every single fish in any of the lakes that we fish eat perch um and especially on uh buffalo pound on the weekend the big perch gobbled this little perch so uh, those are some of the colors but we have those natural colors those natural lookings or glow colors i gotta get this right sorry guys there we go there, there we go, go. There is the uh, quarter ounce real bait in the fire tiger. Fire tiger is probably the most uh, sold color. Um, and there's a very good reason for it. It appeals to our visual. So <laughs> people get sucked into seeing uh, fire tiger. But fire tiger is, you know, that, that loud, obnoxious. So even though this is only an inch and a half long, it, it fishes bigger. It fishes bigger visually 
Um, in colored water, it almost, you know, has a halo. Uh, so I love my glow uh, colors. Um, and then, but after that, I, I really like some of the natural colors like glow, or not glow, this isn't glow. Uh, blue so silver, blue, yeah. blue silver. Yeah, it's kind of um, shiny. You can't see the blue silver, but that's what the color is here. Uh, because when fish comes in on, on the blue silver, you're holding it as steady as you can or as steady as I can. And it's still having a little bit of a wobble in it. And it, it just, it looks like, uh, according to Doug Stangy, um, who I never question from In Fisherman Magazine, field editor, f editor in chief at uh, In Fisherman, he says uh, that that teeter totter, that slight teeter totter on a uh, jig and wrap is a major, a major uh, trigger because watching the minnows in the aquarium at in fishermen a minnow that's about to get eaten is just tweaked it's just hyper tweaked and just vibrating before it makes that final dash to try and save its life but uh, most predators know that too so <laughs> it's a done deal yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah. but um so the silver blue uh the orange gold uh, i like those those natural traditional colors um using these more silver blue and whites in clear water and uh, the fire tiger uh, gold orange in um, stained water. So I hope that helps, Mike. I hope that helps you folks. Um, if you have other favorites, uh, please share with the, with the group um, on the comments. I know everybody would appreciate it. For sure. So we're coming up to the almost one hour portion and we don't have a ton more questions. Uh, but you can always get a hold of us on, on our Cabela's, uh, Bass Pro Cabela's Facebook uh, pages at getfishing.ca, mm -hmm. uh, through our website as well, getfishing.ca, where we've got a whole bunch of featured uh, ice fishing videos. I, I put the link right in the comments here for you to go and tap on it. Um, and obviously become a, a subscriber to our content because that helps us, uh, you know, uh, produce more videos for you. Uh, as we get a little bit of this, which helps us buy the new gear and the latest cameras so we can show you stuff in 4K and all that fun stuff. Um, you know, but it's, uh, we really can't emphasize enough how uh, excited and, and appreciative we are yeah. that we've had consistently between 30 and, and up to 50 people at one point who joined us tonight. Yeah, that's really um, exciting. We, Thanks, we, everybody. Yeah, we know we all have busy lives, and uh, for you to spend this kind of time with us, we, we, we're, we're truly humbled and grateful mm -hmm. for that. And, uh, and Jeff, you go ahead and wrap it up. And Yeah, no, um, I, I'll be coming down tomorrow because I've been just gearing up for this whole week. <laughs> But uh, we'll we'll be picking eggs and uh, picking fry tomorrow at the hatchery. That'll be a perfect activity uh, for me to uh, just unwind. And uh, but thank you again, as Jason said, so much for uh, for sharing this time with us, sharing your time with us. Um, nobody has that to give all the time, so we really appreciate you uh, doing that for us today. And just wanted to finish by saying uh, the Outdoor Ed Ice Fishing Classic, this is ongoing throughout the month of January. Yes. Uh, Gord Pizer and, and Liam Wetter are up, as I understand it, next week at the same time. Yeah. Same time, same channel type of thing. So uh, absolutely tune into them. We're going to do our best to be a part of it. Uh, and, uh, you know, we really, really appreciate, as I say, everybody coming tonight. Make this a part of your Tuesday through the month of January. And we'll see you out on the ice. And as I say, you can get us through our Facebook pages. Uh, you can get us through getfishing.ca. And even we've got contacts right on our website, getfishing.ca as well. So thank you so much, everybody. Again, have a great night. And uh, you can replay and share this with everybody. Happy New Year well. and greatest to, of everything to you all in 2023.